on behalf of MITAC, the MIT Activities Committee, I want to welcome everybody today to the Architectural History of MIT Talk um, Between Tradition and Innovation with Professor Mark Yarzenbeck and Professor John Oxenbach from uh, Dwarf, I'm sorry, <laughs> from the Department of Architecture, um, who will take us on an amazing virtual journey of um, architecture at MIT from 1913 to um, the present expansion in Kendall Square. And um, um, so uh, Mark and John, if you'd like to take it away and bring us on a virtual um, beautiful tour of uh, MIT and the campus, which we, we miss so much these days. Indeed, uh, thank you, Dan. And uh, 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 John and I will sort of um, intersperse uh, our thoughts as we, uh, as we go along. Our emails are up here. If you have any questions um, that you wanna to talk to us about in particular, you can please uh, use those emails to contact us. And I'll just quickly share that I am here on campus uh, in building five and uh, just perhaps an hour ago, I went over to lobby seven and took a photo and uh, also looked down the infinite corridor and took a photo of the infinite corridor. And it's obviously heartbreaking to see our campus empty right now. So we hope to bring a little bit of the campus to you here and um, and this is obviously not going to be ex an exhaustive history of the architectural history of MIT, but more just some things that Mark and I think are important. And he wrote the book on the campus and he is the true architectural historian here. I'm a kind of armchair historian, uh, but between the two of us, we've learned a lot. And, uh, and I helped run the 2016 campus celebration when we celebrated the uh, centennial of being in Cambridge. Um, and Mark, I will uh, give you the control of the remote and you should be able to advance the slides. Yeah, that's not working. So I think um, for some reason we're... I can go ahead and go forward one, okay, there two. There. Um, this is the yeah. view one hour ago in lobby seven of the security desk. Yeah, hopefully one day we'll be able to meet everybody in, in corporeal sense, uh, you know, uh, certainly maybe by fall, I thought that all goes well, um, and, and go back to understanding the campus as we all love it and understand it. Uh, it's not working, so yeah, there you go. So this is, the, of course, dedicated to uh, Barton Rogers, the entrance to MIT, who is uh, the first president of MIT. And this is the second building dedicated to, to Rogers. Um, John, you're gonna have to Move it, yeah. Uh, the, the first building, which doesn't exist anymore, uh, was torn down in the 50s. Um, and the, the location of that arrow has been shifted a little bit somehow in the PowerPoint. Uh, but it's um, in uh, uh, Trin Trinity uh, Square right there. You can sort of see it. And it's this big building here, the first John Hancock uh, building right there is where, where it was. Next. And so you can see, basically, uh, just to remind us that um, Boston was um, the large part of a, a mud flats, and the back half of, uh, of Boston, which is now the Back Bay, was filled in in the mid 19th century. And the central feature of that uh, was uh, Trinity Square, and uh, MIT, and the Natural uh, and the Museum of Natural History were really the two build buildings that were started. And MIT is pictured here just sort of under construction. So it was in a tabula rasa um, at the center of sort of a fabulous new um, in urban environmental plant. And yeah, so this is the first building, the Rogers building. And there were, it was modeled, uh, the next one, um, as you can so see on a building in London, that was a gentleman's house uh, for you know a very high class prestigious man, absolutely. Um, and indeed, the first uh, students you know, of MIT were thought of as gentlemen. So that's where the model was uh, of this. And so uh, next slide, uh, John, um, you know, the students uh, wore coat and ties and you know, had to behave properly. And they were also expected to know some French and French was seen as one of the languages you were skilled in uh, in order to be a conversant uh, gentleman of, of the times. 
Those days have changed considerably, of course. Uh, then uh, the Walker Building was built and that was dedicated uh, specifically to chemistry and those towers on the corners, uh, they look like chimneys, but they're actually vents. So it was a very specific building with a very specific uh, uh, purpose dedicated to the chemistry department and was sort of innovative at that time uh, for its sort of uh, use of, uh, of, of, of ventilation uh, ducts in order to, uh, to make the laboratory safe. And Mark, that building still exists, I think, right? No, no, it was also doesn't. Um, and then there's other buildings uh, as uh, MIT grew. This is all building also didn't exist, the Pierce building, engineering building. So these were sort of large sort of warehouse like buildings uh, that uh, were used by a range of the uh, de uh, departments um, for, you know, this is where some of the uh, engines uh, were developed uh, later on um, in the, uh, for automobiles and so forth like that. Um, and some of the architects were complaining about the, you know, the noise and the shaking of the building <laughs> uh, that were uh, that were done by the engineering department. Um, and then there was a lower laboratory was added to that, which was another custom design building. So MIT was basically uh, between and betwixt other buildings and other factories and other uh, developments and the and the railroad, uh, trying to sort of find itself in this sort of complicated urban environment. And then uh, they ran out of space. And so they looked across the river uh, to the mudflats of Cambridge, which is, this would have looked a little bit like this um, and uh, thought, you know, this is maybe an opportunity. So the, uh, the, you know, sort of the comparison, you know, of the old MIT, which was spread out uh, throughout uh, Boston Back Bay and other parts of Boston um, was, you know, a, a crisis because students, you know, in wintertime had to get, you know, you got to, get your galoshes on and you had to get your scarves and uh, coats on, you know, to walk from one building uh, to the other building. And there was a lot of complaining about that. So there was a lot of desire to have one big building uh, for, the, for the entire uh, institute. And the institute grew dr dramatically. So when it was founded <clears throat> um, in 63, it had four uh, departments uh, by 1900. And we had 13 and, uh, and, and departments were being added sort of continuously. Some of those departments came and some went like the sanitary engineering is not a department anymore. Um, and, you know, electrical engineering, you know, was added um, as opposed to metallurgy. So we can, we can sort of see these departments. MIT had a very flexible understanding of how departments could be added and subtracted compared to other universities. This was one of unique to MIT. It's still today relatively easy to make a department compared to other places. Uh, we're up under the number of 30 uh, now. Um, and uh, this sort of meant that there was a strange flexibility of departments morphing and remorphing uh, over time. <clears throat> so the uh, site for the campus was a swamp on the edge of uh, Cambridge. <clears throat> and uh, the green line is where hard land was and everything else was basically a swampy basin and it was a mosquito infested <laughs> uh, swamp. It was also where the affluent uh, or the affluence where the, where, in a way, the sewage uh, lines ended for uh, Cambridge. Uh, so it was really a stinky, uh, a stinky swamp. Uh, but uh, the urban planners thought it could be developed and indeed it was. And so it was filled in. And of course, urban planners being mainly still by then already uh, organized by real estate developers thought we'll make millions of dollars on this by putting in very high class um, a residential uh, zone. And so they laid out a residential zone for elite um, urban environment. And of course, uh, it didn't work out because the factory district uh, uh, right behind it, uh, next to it, um, uh, John, I'll take the next slide. And the factory district, of course, uh, had the uh, working class people coming and going. Uh, it was also very smelly. You got to remember, you know, early 20th century, you had uh, smokestacks and you had uh, all sorts of industries there. It was highly polluted, highly toxic environment, and not a place where the refined people of Boston <laughs> would want to live. So that didn't work out very well. So it was land became available and MIT uh, saw its opportunity and bought it or bought a big chunk of it, at least not everything, but a big chunk of it. 
the first uh, architect they hired was a guy called Mr. Childs, whose uh, claim to fame was that he was the, uh, uh, he designed the sewage system in Newton. Um, he had absolutely no experience in architecture. And thank God uh, he didn't last very long. His plan was uh, really pretty ugly, but we could have gotten something like that. And MIT really had no idea what it wanted until this guy came along who was Dick Riddell, who was also then came to uh, uh, Ward, who was a de department head, went to France, uh, discovered this man who was eager to come to the United States and make a career for himself. And he became the new uh, department head and he was trained in, in Paris, he was a Frenchman and he loved America, uh, next slide. And um, and of course he brought this idea of this sort of urban grandeur uh, to, uh, to, the, to the project. Next. And uh, he became sort of well known uh, designing this sort of concrete tower uh, for uh, called Beacon of, of Progress for an exhibition in Chicago, uh, which would have been the, the tallest and the largest uh, skyscraper in the world, basically, I don't know, even today, it would have been quite a remarkable thing. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to, to see how small people are. I mean, you can see a few little ditty dots way down here, and, and those are like automobiles, right? So it was totally ginormous. Uh, so he was a very progressive thinker uh, and very bold thinker as well. Next, and he designed for MIT various versions. This version um, was a sort of, you can basically see uh, how it's coming to be. It had a power plant in the back and everything that needed power was close to the back and everything that didn't need power like mathematics uh, and architecture, I mean, didn't need, you know, physical heat, you know, <laughs> for, uh, for the laboratories was up front. Um, and um, it had a running because he wanted people to make an exercise so they, he wanted the, the students to, uh, to run a track every morning. Um, and uh, so it was, you know, beginning to think, think through the complicated uh, program of what an MIT campus could be. Next. And then, um, but he, uh, he ran into trouble with this guy called Freeman, who was a civil engineer at MIT. He was a no-nonsense uh, civil engineer. He loved concrete. He loved big things. He was the engineer who designed Panama Canal. So he, he, <laughs> he was a force to be reckoned with. Um, and he didn't like uh, Depardell. He thought, called him a beauty doctor. And he wanted a uh, campus that was much more functional. And so, yeah, these are the type of things uh, <laughs> he was famous for, uh, digging, the, digging the Panama Canal. So he, uh, he spent some time traveling around Europe, looking at other campuses. Uh, this is the campus uh, of the ETH uh, in Zurich, <clears throat> designed uh, you know, uh, almost at the same time. <clears throat> and he saw that it was big and it was voluminous and it was one building. And he said, that's really great. That's what we want uh, for MIT. So he, he, these are the sketches uh, that he began to assemble of all the universities in Europe that showed, you know, big mega buildings um, that were very uh, unknown really in the United States um, as, as for, for campus at least, right? So he imported the idea of this European uh, mega building and MIT, you know, at a, a million square foot would have been, you know, one of the largest buildings uh, in the United States at the time. And so his plan was very simple. <clears throat> it's a concrete building, columns in the lining the center, uh, floor, floor plate uh, and, um, and an auditorium. And then, you know, um, everything else was wooden walls on the infill. So very simple sort of concrete uh, building. Take the next. And concrete uh, at the time was a new material relatively. I mean, yes, the Romans had it, but people had forgotten how to use it and what it, what it meant like and really only the late 19th century. And so then when you added concrete with steel reinforcement, which was a development in the early 20, uh, 20th century, you get the concrete as we know it today, but that time it was still an experimental material used for factories, but it would, had never been used really, um, um, at least in the United States for anything larger for a public building. So, um, and we can sort of see how these concrete in some of the building uh, still exists, even though today, uh, because of the infill and so forth, you don't really see the innovative use of the concrete. We don't see it as a very radical modern building, but it certainly would have been. And of course, there's the corridor in the center that, uh, uh, that, that linked the building's uh, internal organization. 
At that time, it was also quite innovative. Uh, buildings didn't have long, 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 long corridors. We associate them with buildings like this today as very common. But at that time, it was uh, also something that had been developed in Europe um, and less so in the United States. And I might just add how important this has been for the culture of MIT, because most campuses had isolated buildings. So you would have civil engineering here, mathematics here, and you know, uh, mechanical engineering over there or biology. And so by connecting them together and having boundaries very porous, you know, I really believe that helped influence the culture of MIT to be able to cross departments easier than the individual islands. And I think Freeman talked about this saying, you know, creating little kingdoms of music and mathematics isn't really a good thing to solve problems. So he was thinking about, this is the time of the assembly line and Henry Ford. So he's thinking about efficiency of long open plans, right? Absolutely, yeah. He, he basically gave to MIT the, this flexible identity which is in the corridor. It didn't exactly always work out because once you give a professor an office, that professor is probably not budging. Uh, but um, as we all know, the corridor turned out to be, you know, semi-workable in its elasticity. And yeah, so you can sort of see, you know, so he, he wrote the, the names of the apartments at an angle because yeah, it could be here, it could be there, you know, we, we don't know yet. Right, so it's all to be sort of uh, to be negotiated, um, and that was you know quite innovative, right? And what John is saying is that you know normally it would have been yeah, you know separate fiefdoms, and that's not what he wanted. The other part was the windows, <clears throat> so he wanted very a lot of open windows bringing in uh, light, <clears throat> and so he designed these uh, huge. Uh, three-story high windows uh, that at the time wouldn't have ever existed. Um, they, they're sort of curtain windows and that they cover the spandrels on the inside. Uh, next slide will show sort of like what you know what you would have found at the same time being built like at Harvard. So this is a standard building you know with with uh, with with you know windows as you would have understood them. So the windows were extremely uh, important to him and, um, and 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 a special design feature. So um, President McLaurin at the time uh, uh, liked Freeman's innovations, but he wanted a building that uh, was a little bit grander. Um, and uh, that, by that time, Depardell had, had died. And so he said, basically, thank, thank you to Freeman and we'll move on to find an architect. Freeman was not happy with that decision. Um, and he sort of became a little bit pissed off and burned some of his plans ostensibly. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the new architect, they hired a guy uh, called Bosworth. You can sort of see Bosworth <clears throat> was a person who did respect what Freeman had to offer. So he wasn't, uh, uh, you know, uh, just throwing it all out the gar garbage. And seriously, Bosworth, with four of the most richest people in the world, um, who were became sort of, uh, in one way or the other, related to, to uh, MIT, but in particular, this guy, Theodore Vail, who is the president of AT&T and also the president of a couple of banks. Um, and, um, and then of course we have Trowbridge and Pete Morgan and, 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 and Rockville. And he had worked with them on various projects. <clears throat> so he had built uh, for Vail, the headquarters of AT&T. Um, he had just sort of finished that in New York City, which still exists. It's a beautiful building and you can see a lot of classical columns. Bosworth had just worked uh, got to earn his career at MIT, but then he went to get a finishing degree in Paris at the Ecole de Beaux Arts. So he was a Bosworth was an Ohio uh, um, um, Ohio man, plain spoken, uh, very direct, but also had the uh, the I don't know the, <laughs> the the flourish of the French as well. So he could you know speak both sides of that uh, for, to his for his clients, and so he made a slightly improved version of the Freeman plan. Uh, the one that we know today, which is the main quad uh, facing the river along Massachusetts Avenue. I, would, I will just point out the giant statue in the center of Killian Court. I think that was Athena. Was that the proposal? Yeah, Minerva, yeah. Minerva, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Roman but, uh, goddess of wisdom. Yeah, and that never happened. I don't know. MIT was too cheap or didn't, <laughs> mm -hmm. didn't want the big statue in front. So <clears throat> never happened. But Vail uh, gave his collection uh, to the library. Um, and indeed, the uh, library is a sort of a celebration of Vail's uh, generosity. Um, it was a huge uh, collection uh, of engineering and chemistry engineering books. Uh, took five years to catalog. Um, 
and so it became, if, if you will, sort of part of the, uh, the, 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 the gifting and the transformation of MIT from a relatively badly funded public, in, public institution from the state of Massachusetts uh, to a privately endowed institution as a private, you know, private institute as it is today. Um, and of course, there's the Eastman money that came from Eastman, uh, but from Eastman Kodak, who was never at MIT, but somehow loved what MIT stood for um, and gave MIT the millions uh, to fund the building. The famous Mr. Smith, an anonymous donor at that scale, which is a bit hard to imagine today, but extraordinary. It was, yeah, it was a, a, a huge gift um, of an extraordinary amount. And not that, and in fact, that he wasn't an alum is even more extraordinary. Bosworth divided the campus into these two zones, the zone to the, the over to the far left across the Massachusetts had wasn't developed yet. So it was the idea was the academic side on one on the left and then the right, the uh, residential side and the president's uh, house down here. So it sort of became, that became the model, even though over time it was sort of abandoned um, and, and didn't quite work out that way. Um, but to honor Vail, uh, Bosworth sort of borrowed the doors that he designed for Vail. So the next one, here's his Vail's headquarters on the next slide. And you can sort of see the, the doors <clears throat> from the Vail headquarters basically copied at MIT. But instead of being very expensive uh, bra uh, brass, uh, they're in a somewhat cheaper version of it in bronze, but they're basically the, the doors of Vail's uh, uh, AT&T headquarters building to acknowledge the donor. Um, but we got really beautiful doors out of it. And just showing you a copy of the book. Um, we have a book that we can we will give out um, at the end uh, arbitrarily to someone one of you that we can mail to if you're interested in. Um, I'm not sure exactly how we're doing it, Diane, where someone just says, I'd like to have a copy. And we'll I think they're going to randomly draw a name and there will be one lucky winner who's rewarded for okay, staying we'll randomly through draw, an hour. Draw, yeah, draw a name and then Diane will contact you. And if you want it, uh, you got to send your address. Yes, that's right. Okay. Thank okay. you. And this is a fa fabulous book that Mark has written. It's original research and it's thin and it's a great read. So um, even if you don't win the copy today, I recommend, I think you can get it on Amazon in a paperback. So I'm your agent today, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so the building's gone through various transformations. I mean, we look at this today and it looks like, wow, that's a pretty impressive building. Uh, today, of course, when you look at it the next, uh, you know, it's covered with trees. Sorry. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> and the trees are beautiful, of course, but we can't see much of the building. Um, which disappoints me. Um, and then in M MIT in his infinite wisdom some 10 years ago decided to plant these uh, cherry trees in front uh, of, the, of the beautiful entrance. And the trouble is, you know, uh, next slide, little trees become, uh, become big trees. So uh, I have <laughs> asked them to keep the trees pruned, but whether other people agree with that or not, I don't know. I, I think we would be great to see the building uh, rather than to, to cover it up. Um, and, and in recent years, MIT has done a better job. It used to be you could hardly see the building uh, from all the woods around it. And now they've cut down the bushes and the shrubbery. And so at least you can see uh, what, what we're talking about. Uh, the building's also obviously transformed, as you, all of you know, by all the stuff that's in the ceilings. The ceilings are 15 foot high ceilings before air conditioning and heating. And the idea of the high ceilings was, of course, a practical one. Uh, the idea was that if there are any fumes would collect, um, they would they would rise to the top. But we all know that fumes, some fumes go down and some fumes go up. Uh, but the, at least the fumes that go up would be filtered up and out of the building. Then, of course, came air conditioning and the heat heat ducts and all the piping and so forth. But it just speaks to the generosity of the scale of the old building that all of that it really is not a problem. The building did not need to be redesigned. And I might just add that these original three-story windows were double hung, hung sashes that could open at the top and bottom. So you would get fresh, cool air coming below, hot air venting outside. And from both the standpoint of sustainability and, and also public health and natural ventilation, that idea is a brilliant idea that we're now spending a lot of money 
to repair those old windows to, so that they can open again, so that if you're lecturing in one of these rooms, you can actually raise the sash, get fresh air coming in. And in a, in a, you know, certainly in a pandemic, you want fresh air in your classroom, but also from an environmental standpoint, we don't need to be air conditioning on a 65 degree day when you can open the windows. So, so in some ways, the original design ideas worked so well that we painted the windows shut and forgot about their good innovations. And now we're trying to recover them for the 21st century. Exactly, yeah. Um, I mean, Marty Schmidt can tell you there's, you know, MIT made a huge study of the MIT windows because they thought they were gonna replace them all with modern windows. Um, and after two years of study, they discovered when they took all, took the windows apart, you can't improve on them, <clears throat> right? So the windows from 1913 turned out to be some of the best windows that had ever been fabricated you know, in the history of civilization. <laughs> and as if we've been upgrading them and replacing them, I mean, it's, we're spending a, a pretty penny on each individual window, but in my mind, it's absolutely worth it because, you know, we've been here for a hundred years and we expect to be here in a hundred years. So the windows were built to last a hundred years and, and we're and, rediscovering. And more, they would have lasted longer, unfortunately, go back, uh, Sorry. instead of being unpainted, because they're, they're a very high fired iron, which meant that they actually don't rust. But MIT thought, saw iron and they thought, oh my God, they're gonna rust. And so they painted them, which actually now guaranteed that the moisture would be on the- on the Trapped and cause track. corrosion as a result. So MIT really mishandled uh, these windows. All, they, all you had to do is every year, wipe a little oil on them and that would have been, been fine. So, and then in the late thirties, uh, Bosworth was invited back to then design and finish the part of the complex that hadn't been done, which was this hole. Uh, between these buildings, uh, which was the, the great entry, which is really one of the great, uh, you know, entryway sequences into a building in, in, in Boston, in, in, in New England, uh, for sure. And this was done in the mid to late 30s. This is about 20 years after the original campus opened. So when you come into Lobby 7 and you see that dome, you have to imagine that's 20 years after the main dome at Killian Court. That's right. Yeah. Um, and it also has this wonderful dome that is now uh, it's already finished the restoration that's been restored, the, the Oculus, maybe it's already finished, restored, I'm not exactly sure, but in the process now of being restore, restored. Yeah, I, I just want to give a shout out here to MIT's uh, campus facilities and campus planning. They've been paying much greater attention to preservation and uh, they've done a really beautiful job restoring the skylights in both of our two main domes so that now they're they're back to what they would have been like when they were first. They were painted over, I think, in World War II to prevent being bombed um, as targets. Um, so, but now they, they're really stunning restorations. So the next time you are able to go in there, please do admire both of those skylights. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> so when you walk up the steps, you'll notice the a strange thing, I hope, is that the bottom steps are curved slightly. And take the next slide and you'll sort of see this little curve there. And you might, you might wonder, well, what's that all that about? Uh, I don't know, maybe you don't, but <laughs> so anyway, you see there's the curved part and the straight part. And so the curved part is Bosworth's attempt to unify uh, the, the, the outer rim of the building with the, with the building itself. And you can sort of see from the plan, the next, uh, that the center of the curve is in the center of building 10. <clears throat> so when you walk up, up that curve, you're sort of already sort of in, in a way entering the sphere uh, off the off, off the campus, and and Mark, did you discover that from original drawings as you were writing the book, or how did you figure out that the curvature of the front step aligns in the in lobby ten? I just measured it. It's not too hard. You you measure the curvature, you come up with a radius, and voila. I mean, that's I, what I did. That's what I love about your work as a historian, Mark, because you're trained as an architect, you draw, so you investigate history through analytical drawing. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Right. I was always wondering about the curve and finally it sort of made sense and I had to prove it, but that's what it is. That's a beautiful discovery. So, yeah, and I like the way that the architect basically is getting you just the feel of the campus as this sort of spherical thing, you know, and you're stepping onto this platform and into the campus, a very welcoming uh, type of an idea. Mm. Uh, the other question, curiosity about this uh, entrance is this column, and I'm not talking about the Home Depot uh, greenery uh, that somehow gets added there every now and then, uh, but I have a little video clip uh, that will show you this strange feature. 
So here we are walking up and, you know, everything's going good, looking good. And you look at the wonderful column modeled on a Greek temple and you open the door and you go in and then, whoops, okay. Something happened uh, to that column. So on the outside, it's, it's fluted. In other words, it has these vertical things and uh, you can go to the next slide. And on this side, it's not. So this is the strangest column that has ever been made that I've ever seen anywhere. Uh, I could, there's no precedent for it. And uh, next shows a little plan and you can sort of see <laughs> the outside is fluted inside. So why did Basra do this? Because this is like illegal in, in, in a way, right? Columns have to be completely round things that stand up and do what they have to do and not half, half in and half out. So if you go to the next, next slide, John, um, so this is what we have today the, with the naked, naked columns. And these are ionic columns and ionic columns by law, so to speak, in the classical tradition have to have flutes. There's no such thing as an ionic column with no flutes. So this is, I, next, show, show, next slide, we'll show you what he should have done, right? Which will be fluted everywhere. So the next slide, so why did he not do the flutes? Well, there are several possibilities. One is that MIT couldn't afford flutes which of course you could say maybe they just, you know, maybe ran out of budget, but that can't be because they spent a lot of money on the front with, with flutes. So my suggestion is that basically he wanted to say, we don't have time for flutes, maybe later on we'll get to them. Right now we have to get to work. We have to get our job done. We have to start studying. So let's just sort of be very practical and, you know, and be sort of uh, get, get to work on it. So. I, th I think he left them out on purpose as a way to maybe say, eventually we'll have the time to do this, but we don't have time for it now. We're busy uh, studying and teaching and learning. You know, that's another beautiful discovery you made, the, the idea that it's, you know, outside there's some decoration, but once you go inside, it's all business. All business um, sure. And I would also add that this, this generation of architects were really looking to classical architecture for inspiration, the so-called Beaux-Arts, uh, you know, neoclassical architects but they were not afraid to innovate. And so I believe uh, that these interior columns are also material science innovation that are cast concrete. So they're a kind of cast stone or artificial stone with a very fine aggregate. And they're, you can think of them as experiments in making artificial stone. And so there may have been a very practical side of casting the columns that also made it easier to do smooth if they're casting in formwork rather than in flutes. But that's something we could continue discussing. I think so Another too. Day. I think, yeah, yeah. So he was definitely experimenting with the sort of the cast stone, you know, methodologies. John, you want to start talking about this? Yeah, well, I, maybe you could just share that one last discovery you made about Kresge versus the two domes. I think that's a lovely. Oh, OK. I think that might be the next slide. Uh, okay, so when um, when MIT sort of moved across uh, to the other side of Massachusetts Avenue, the idea was it would become the campus where the sports uh, and where where community of MIT would be sort of celebrated. Um, and Sarnen was called in uh, to make uh, a complex here, and he basically took the two domes uh, and made the line between the two domes descending from the upper dome to this dome, to that dome. And so actually on in, in, in elevation, the line descends at an angle and therefore uniting the, the old school, if you will, uh, with sort of the, the, the modern um, understanding, but at, an, at a dynamic angle, um, which I think sort of integrates the old and the new that was according to his sort of hope uh, very well. And of course the chapel was meant to sort of be a place where uh, the entire um, sort of uh, community of MIT could come and, 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 and worship. And the um, auditorium was where everyone could fit into one space, uh, at least in those days. You know, these projects by Saarinen are really an example of MIT pioneering in the 1950s, but uh, you can think of the same thing with Baker House and other you know, mid-century modern buildings that are absolutely at the forefront. And in this case, it's really all about geometry and, um, and the fact that the chapel is a, is a cylinder and Kresge is one eighth of a sphere. 
but more importantly, Kresge is part of a, of a real innovation in thin shell concrete, long spans and thin shell concrete that uh, there was a World Congress on this at MIT in the, in, uh, the early uh, 50s, I believe. And what's, ex what's exciting about Kresge is the idea that you could bring the whole community together under a single six inch thick concrete shell. So it seemed like a great post-war efficiency for long spans, thin shells. These were mathematical forms that required lots of equations to try to figure out how they would stand up. And here you see the formwork, the fact that it's a section of a sphere makes it easier to build because you can lay out on a single degree of curvature, um, you know, in a day where there are no computers and it's harder to do the, the 3D models. Mm -hmm. um, and, but when they cast the concrete on top and they lowered the formwork for the first time, the concrete shell lurched, it dropped by about six inches on the edges. And um, hoping there are no children present, this is what is known in the construction industry is an oh shit moment where <laughs> they put the formwork back up again to hold up the concrete shell and they ended up propping it up at the edges with mullions that you can see on the along the side so the next time you're in Kresge take a careful look at the at the columns that are supporting the glass wall but they're also propping up the edge and um and so Sarnan's decision to use an eighth of a sphere made it easier to build but it wasn't a great form structurally. It, we could make it much thinner if you did something closer to a fabric hanging in three dimensions uh, under its own weight and, and you would get a slightly different geometry but you could build it more efficiently. And so on a recent uh, winter morning, uh, my colleague Caitlin Mueller with students had uh, studied ice sculptures that would take hanging forms in, in water they would freeze and then you could invert them. And so this is Professor Mueller's redesigned Kresge Auditorium with a frozen fabric sheet. If you just take a very simple fabric sheet and you can see what it does is it develops these ribs and the edges turn up a little bit. So it's a much more dynamic form uh, and it could have been paper thin but it would have been much more difficult to build. And, uh, but Kresge still is, some, is a building that we think about a lot. It still inspires us. And, uh, and MIT has just done this incredible renovation of the, of the glass curtain wall to upgrade its energy efficiency. And, um, and so I'd like to just say a few words about the domes of MIT. Of course, that, that Kresge is, is you know, one of our great mid-century domes, but the original dome that, that Mark was referring to uh, of uh, the main library was inspired, of course, by the Pantheon in Rome, but you can see how it's somewhere in between you know, a Greek temple and a Roman dome. And in fact, um, I think you also discovered, Mark, this fascinating question of how high the main dome should be. And they had built a model where they could actually crank the dome up or down and they could study the proper height. Do you want to share, is that, do you want to share that, Mark? Yeah, I don't have, uh, I didn't put that slide in, but Bosworth made a model where he could lower and raise the dome and then, because he wanted it to be visible from the street, whereas the Pantheon dome in Rome is then not visible. And, you know, that was part of the surprise of the Romans liked it, but he didn't like it. So he wanted the dome to be visible. So he had to like lift, lift it up on, this, on, on the drum, which is sort of down here. And so the question of where would be the ideal height, if you stand back at the, at the front of Killing Court, you can just see the 1916 on the base of the dome here. So there's a kind of ideal standpoint there. Um, for me, one of the fascinating things about the original dome here is it was done so around 1915, but in concrete. And you can see it's a kind of a double dome with an exterior and an interior. And this is something that was pretty common um, from the Renaissance onward. Um, but it was not an easy thing to do to build a concrete dome in the 19 teens. And in fact, uh, it would have been much more common. There were 100 domes being built around the US at that time in thin brick by an immigrant family who I've been studying for about 20 years named the Guastavino family. Um, and so one of my great puzzles is why this dome was not Guastavino. But what you can see is that like the Pantheon in Rome, it was designed to be a perfect sphere on the inside. Um, although, it, and if you go into Barker now, um, the difference here is of course, the floor level is much higher than it would be if you're in the Pantheon in Rome where you're, you're, you're really down at the floor. Um, and, but those renovations recently that also restored the skylight and Barker so that now you not only have the natural light, but you have this additional light. 
is really harking back to the Pantheon and showing, you know, both the coffer system that you have there, but also the Oculus and um, and it's, it's an age old idea. Of course, we have Jefferson's Rotunda, which is also modeled on the Pantheon and meant to be a library. Big uh, voids aren't really great for libraries. It's a kind of romantic notion, but it's not very practical because where do you put all the books? They're on the outside, but, um, but Barker has served us well. And then the other interesting dome or vault I would like to share is at MIT's oldest building, which was of course the Riverbank Court Hotel finished in 1901, which then MIT purchased in 1937, and it became the original Ashdown House, so often a graduate residence hall, and then um, and then more recently has become Massey Hall. So it is now uh, it's been a dormitory for uh, since 1937 for MIT, but it but it actually predates MIT. So if you look at photos that Mark was showing from Cambridge in 1901. The River Bancourt Hotel is kind of one lone structure rising up out of the mudflats, and now it's been swallowed up by MIT. But but I'd like you to appreciate this building next time you go there, and in particular the the porte cochere in the, in the uh, center allows for carriages to go through and drop off guests at the hotel. And now that's enclosed as the lobby of Massey Hall. But and uh, this is a recent photo of the interior. But at the time, it was completely open. So a carriage and then an automobile eventually could go and drop off guests and, um, and be dropped in. But this particular vaulted ceiling in thin tile at Massey Hall and formerly Ashdown, formerly Riverbank Court Hotel, is a really significant project in American architectural history because it was in some ways a prototype for the main uh, vaulted lobby of Ellis Island where so many uh, new Americans arrived, including my great grandparents from Italy in 1920. So you can look at the vault of Ellis Island and you can see a direct correlation between what is now the lobby of Massey Hall done about 15 years earlier by the Guastavino company. And um, shameless self-promotion, uh, you can find a book on Amazon and one lucky winner will, will win this book in our drawing today, um, which tells the story of Ellis Island and a thousand projects across the United States built by this family of immigrants who have essentially labored uh, as, as uh, not really well-known contributors to American architecture and, and my books tried to correct that record. But I do hope you'll go and visit the small lobby in Massey Hall as well when you have a chance and, uh, and admire this complex curvature in brick done in an age before there were computers. And so drawing that curve in 3D uh, would be a challenge for our students today. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll just say that the Guastavinos were able to do very large domes, the size of Barker, only four inches thick. And that was not achieved in reinforced concrete until 30 or 40 years later with the rise of thin shells around the time of Kresge. Um, and so it's, I, it's still a bit of a mystery to me. And, and hopefully I'll get a student to do a thesis on this in the coming years about really digging into the archives and trying to understand the costs and the decisions around the concrete for the Barker Dome. I think a lot of it had to do with progress ideology of concrete as a material of the future and brick as a material of the 19th century. We're gonna go with the 20th century concrete. Um, and so with that, I'll hand it back to you, Mark. Well, the, the history of the domes at MIT is certainly um, a, a powerful one. And even though it's sort of, people don't sort of think of it as going off into the future, but we have the, Many sort of domes from the, this one, the, the first one from, let's say, built in, opened in 1916, right, all the way to the last one uh, by Frank Gehry, which was sort of a dome, but then didn't become a dome. And so it's sort of the leftover of what he wanted to be a dome, which was sort of the answer to 77 Mass Ave. Um, so we can sort of see here, he made a, a ball, uh, so, sort of was sort of a, a dome in the form of a ball that didn't get funded. Uh, was too expensive. So they just left the hole in the ceiling as sort of uh, as the oculus. So this is sort of the entrance sequence that Gary had imagined, which was the, 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 the response to 77 Mass Ave Dome. And, and of course also to Sarnen. So it sort of has its own sort of architects talking about each other. So here we see the building sort of under construction sort of as his sort of play on the theme of, of MIT and its, uh, and its domes. Uh, yeah, I'll take next. Yeah, just sort of 
crazy, a crazy building as we all know. Uh, so <laughs> it looks a little bit like somebody threw up on Vassar Street somewhere. I mean, you know, from, from up high. Um, and it, people love it and people hate it. But I think over the time people have become to appreciate it, especially the, uh, uh, the, the in, internal street, uh, which is extremely beautiful and, and, and dynamic, despite the fact that it leaks and it's going to be under renovation now for the next five, 10 years. And is a real homage in some ways to the infinite corridor, but with more gathering spaces off to the side. So it's a, it's a kind of meandering street. And, and I have to say, you know, in the 18 years I've been in MIT, I think it's really one of our more successful spaces in terms of both passing through, but also gathering and, and students working. And, and it's also a credit to MIT because they asked Frank Gehry specifically, we don't want just a narrow little you know, restricted corridor spaces. We want um, the space to be uh, a gathering space, a social condenser space. Um, and that's, you know, what he did. So, uh, you know, it took uh, the client as well to do that. So MIT is running out of space, you know, now. I mean, it, the campus is filling up um, as, and it becomes increasingly a problem. So the, the beautiful infill building of the physics department uh, took one of the courtyards away. Uh, but it's a fantastic project uh, by Payette. And then, of course, there's the Nano Lab, which was built sort of behind uh, or right next to uh, the, uh, the, the library dome, um, which was an, another innovation, basically, because it's in a swamp, which still exists. Um, they built this big bathtub uh, out, of, uh, out of concrete and then filled it with sand, uh, six foot high sand and then put the building on top of that. And that way it protected it from the vibrations, uh, sort of the noise pollution uh, for, for, the, uh, for the laboratory. And that was an incredibly difficult project for MIT to build because just accessing the site. Um, and I will say when I first arrived for my interview to join the faculty in 2000, I got off at of Kendall Square and I wandered to exactly where Nano is in the backside of, of Lobby 10. And, and I asked someone, uh, can you tell me how to get to MIT? And they said, you're right in the middle of it. Because before the Gary building, you remember there was really no entrance from MIT. There wasn't anything uh, from Kendall. There wasn't anything that said, you're now at MIT. There were parking garages and it was a kind of alleyways for delivery trucks. And so I think we've done a much better job urbanistically and, and landscape wise so that now, you know, you know when you've arrived on campus. Absolutely. And then of course there's Simmons Hall um, which was, you know, the most expensive dormitory in the history of civilization per square foot. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing, <laughs> um, but an astonishing building. Uh, nonetheless, um, what we see on, on the outside is the metal skin. Uh, the the uh, idea apparently came to the designer, uh, Stephen Hall, when he was taking a shower and he had a sponge in his hand and he said, oh, this would make a good building. So basically we got, his, we got his, the sponge. So what we see is a metal cladding off a concrete building. Concrete is not used anymore today in most buildings because it's way, 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 way too expensive. So most buildings today are built out of steel, very cheap commodity. You, you slap some steel beams together and then you make a cladding. Here, this is pre-stressed clad concrete building, uh, pre-assembled and then assembled on site and stressed. Yeah, it was a very innovative system, and each each dormitory has a nine of the windows, three windows high. So it's it's um, it's somewhat um, misleading, or it's hard to judge the scale of the building. Mm -hmm. And one of the really exciting aspects, where uh, an engineer, Guy Nordenson, who's an MIT alum, um, had a drawing of the reinforcement ratios in different parts, steel reinforcement in the concrete, and it was color coded. And Gary saw, or not Gary, Steve Hall saw it and loved it and ended up using the color coding in the outside of Simmons Hall. So in some ways you can read the reinforcing or the stresses in the building into the color. And I have to say, as someone who lived on campus for seven years, this is a very successful building in terms of building community on our campus. I think it's a really strong community that Simmons has. And uh, the facade has been used for Tetris and other things as some of you may know. So red, red is tension, uh, yellow is something in between, and then the, the, the non-colored parts are compression. So that's, that's what the, the, the colors are. And he just basically took that and said, that's great. I got my, I got my color scheme. So yeah, we go to the next one. 
Um, and so that then, you know, opens up the question about uh, sort of the north and east campus areas, which have been developed um, over the last uh, five or six years now, that, that, you know, billions of dollars of investment has gone into that. Um, and at one moment, it was the hottest real estate market in the country. Um, and yeah, what to do with Kendall Square. So it was a very contentious issue for a long time. Uh, and eventually it, it got sorted itself out. So we're now having several buildings uh, uh, designed by some lead architects. Um, it, it's hard to know if you're gonna get, you know, five very talented buildings right next to each other, whether that's gonna work as a cohesion or not, we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, but it certainly is going to sort of transform Kendall Square and of course MIT making sort of the entrance of the MIT instead of being on Mass Ave, which is the traditional entrance is now gonna be you know, from uh, the subway entrance, which is gonna be now really the, the new entry uh, place uh, for MIT. And one of the most exciting aspects of this development for me is putting the MIT Museum, moving the MIT Museum right next to the subway and really celebrating MIT in the museum as a gateway. So, so you can imagine future visitors, this is about a year and a half from now, are going to get off at Kendall Square and they're going to be able to go right into the MIT Museum, hear the story of MIT, meet our, our community and our projects through the MIT Museum, have activities there, and then go on to campus, which is a far cry from 20 years ago when I arrived, not, never having been to MIT and saying, how do I get to MIT? So I think this is a tremendous effort to redevelop Kendall, not only as a real estate development, but also there's a new graduate dormitory of 500 beds for graduate students, housing is obviously very tight in Cambridge. Um, and, uh, and I think we're running a little short on time, so I'll just go quickly on to uh, just a few words about the Collier Memorial right in front of the Gary Building, which is um, designed by uh, Howler and Yoon, our former head of architecture, Mi Jin Yoon, um, as a memorial to Officer Sean Collier, who was sadly killed uh, by the Boston Marathon bombers on our campus. And um, I, I can really recommend a video on YouTube called The Making of the Collier Memorial, which goes into much more detail with some really moving images. Um, but I'll just say that I was involved in a pro bono capacity as a consulting engineer, helping lead a team of 16 students from eight different degree programs, developing the geometry so that these interlocking solid granite blocks would stand in three-dimensional equilibrium. And we cut the blocks with a robotic arm with a giant saw blade on the, on the top of it. This looks like something out of a horror film, perhaps, if you lose control of the robot. Um, but it gave us very high accuracy to within about a millimeter for each stone. And then we built the memorial as a giant science experiment, had two master's students working on it, uh, monitoring stresses and forces and proving that it can stand as, as an arch, as a three-dimensional arch system. And, uh, and that was very exciting for all of us design and fabrication in only about nine months. Um, let, me, let me say one more thing about that. Please. So the MIT uh, gave uh, Mijin and John the commission saying, we don't want a building or don't want a memorial with veneer. We want real stones. And it had us be made out of, that's it. Um, but no one had made a building out of real stones, load bearing stones since the 13th century, <laughs> right? <clears throat> <laughs> well, there are a few, but this oh, was few, uh, but not many. This was this challenging. Was part of the innovation was, you know, th this is a real stone here, and it really weighs, you know, for twenty tons, and it's held up by that stone, and so forth and so on. Right? There's no steel in here. There's no concrete. Right. Well, this is that, that keystone there, which weighs I don't know how much was it weigh fifteen tons. Yeah, fifteen tons. Yeah. Yeah, fifteen ton keystone is is is, is you know. That's it, it's held up by all these other stones. And the whole thing is 200 tons of granite. I appreciate that, that tribute, Mark. I mean, the reality is from Collier Strong, MIT Strong, you know, using solid blocks of granite. Um, and, you know, we designed this to last for a thousand years. So yeah. I, I can safely predict that it's going to outlast some of the other buildings around it in Kendall Square. No, a thousand years from now, this will be the only thing that's left uh, <laughs> of MIT campus. Well, we'll see. Um, and so then I'll just close by looking to the future. And there's some really exciting developments coming in the, in the next uh, couple of years, moving academic buildings across Mass Ave into what has been a residential and really athletic mm -hmm. complex. So right behind Kresge, there's a new music and theater arts building by the incredible Japanese architect Sana. 
And it's going to, it's a really exciting design that'll be unveiled in the next year or so. And, uh, and that's really gonna bring the performing arts and music right into the heart of residence. And, and, uh, and I hope all of you will be able to attend concerts there in the future. I think that's really gonna enliven, you know, so replacing a parking lot with performing arts uh, is also a move away from the private automobile. And then the last uh, project is the Metropolitan Warehouse, which has been something of a, of a mystery for MIT of what to do with it for decades now. It's been a storage building uh, is going to become the new home of architecture and planning. So that's a very exciting future for our campus. And we are at almost one hour. I mean, we're professors. We could go on for three hours, but uh, hopefully you've enjoyed. We thank all of you for joining and hopefully you've enjoyed this overview. And I just want to say what a pleasure it was to be able to do this with you, Mark. Mark and John, thank you so much uh, for this amazing talk today. Truly remarkable. Um, I think there were some questions which came in yeah, before we get to uh, those questions, we real quick want to announce the winners of our drawings. Uh, so for John o Oxendorf's book, congratulations, Shannon Gamachi Scurry, and I'm so sorry if I butcher some names. And for Professor Mark Jasenberg's book, uh, congratulations to Deborah Lou Channon. Uh, we will send both of you an email after the talk just so we can confirm uh, your mailing addresses and send you those books. Yeah, and now uh, we can get to questions. So let me just scroll up to those. Uh, first off, a comment from George Verges. He said that the unfluted columns are great for postering. And having been an undergrad at MIT, I must say that there are a number of uh, nocturnal undergraduate shenanigans that have only happened because those columns are unfluted. So a uh, great, great little architectural okay. tidbit. Thank you, George. That's a wonderful <laughs> comment. And it's absolutely true. People put posters on them and you can write on the poster and the whole community gets to communicate. And that would not happen if they were fluted. Would not. Uh, a question from Barbara Blanchard. She asks, uh, considering climate change, is MIT in danger of rising waters in the Charles <laughs> River? Um, well, I can quickly say that uh, I think there's more work to be done on adaptation and resilience for the city of Boston and Cambridge, but the, the tidal flows are controlled by gates down at the Museum of Science. And so, you know, the way Venice and London have created storm barriers, um, you know, we more or less have that already. The, we're maybe eight, 10 feet above, but we, um, but the main group is also sinking into the ground. So it's gone down a little bit over the last century because it's on wooden piles and clay. So um, the combination of the main group going down and the waters rising is eventually going to be a problem, but I'd say we, probably have about two centuries before it becomes severe. But I don't know if Mark would agree with my assessment. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, we have, yeah, the, the, you know, there's the sinking and the rising, the sinking of the building and the rising of the water. So somewhere in there, there's eventually some, it's gonna be, a, you know, it's gonna get tight, but hopefully we have another hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> Great, it will be a, a problem for future generations yes, to ponder sadly, about. Sadly enough. Uh, Edward asks, I, I heard the, the walls in the main group were built in such a manner that they could be moved, albeit not easily. Is this true? Yes, originally the walls on the main group were designed to be thin, like plywood walls uh, that could be readily moved. Uh, and Bosworth calls them curtains. Um, so, um, and, but, um, yeah, so that was the idea, you know, uh, of course, by the time you build the walls and someone has their equipment and this and that, it, it turned out to be a little bit harder to, <laughs> to move the walls. Uh, then there's fire or fire walls get put in because of, you know, people have equipment that can get hot. And so you have to put in, um, non, you know, fire yeah, fireproof walls, con concrete and whatever. The flexibility was certainly part of the idea that departments could be flexible and change over time. And some of the spaces are larger and could have partitions chopping them up. So um, 
And it worked to some degree. I mean, my office, when I leave my office to go to, let's say, headquarters, I pass a skin lab. I pass an uh, undergraduate reading room. I pass uh, a, a part of something that belongs to the library. Uh, I pass something that belongs to mechanical engineering. And then I get back into architecture. So the departments in some places are quite interblended with each other. Mm -hmm. And that is sort of what Bosworth had intended. And I mean, Freeman had intended, right? This sort of interblending of these things as opposed to hard boundaries between departments. All right. Another question also from Edward. Was MIT Henge planned or was it just dumb luck? So for those of you who don't know, uh, twice a year, the sun sets more or less aligned with the infinite corridor and uh, happens late afternoon. It happened late afternoon just uh, a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, I have my own opinion. What do you think, Margaret? <laughs> I sort of think it was more by accident, but uh, what do you think? I think it's by accident. I don't, I don't think, it'd be one thing if it, if it had fell and aligned on the date of the birthday of William Barton Rogers, which <laughs> frankly is what the ancient Egyptians did. I mean, they were extraordinary at aligning, you know, astronomical it events. Be true. Maybe we just forgot, maybe, or, or maybe we haven't thought about it properly yet. So there's a mystery to be solved, but mystery. my guess is that it's a happy coincidence. But it's certainly a happy one. It's All right. Well, everyone listening right now, you should go look up if the dates are of any significance. Maybe you're, exactly. you'll uncover something. Um, next question. Why are the buildings numbered the way they are? Ah, Mark can explain this. Uh, well, um, I, well, uh, the, what I understand is that it was actually quite simple. Uh, they were numbered in order of sequence of, in which they were built on the, on the engineering plan. So the first one to get started was uh, building one. So they just sort of more or less began to number them, uh, even though the sequence of construction was not quite that way. But they did begin with one and then with number two and then work their way back. Um, in and that explains why you have odd on one side and even on the other, because they were built incredibly quickly. I mean, there were rail lines set up in the yard and the whole complex was built in about two years, which you look at it today and, you know, our buildings take five years and uh, never come in on budget. And so if you're trying to build the campus quickly, you don't work your way all the way around, but you do two buildings in parallel and then proceed. So the even and odd was partly by design. Some of the building numbers shifted over time. So if you go back and look at original construction photos, they'll say this is building 14 rather than 10. So um, the numbers have shifted a bit, but, but I agree with Marx that they were basically in order of construction. That's right, the, the railway, they built this railroad to a spur that carried the stones and the concrete, you know, right into Killian Court and so the spur would end and then you unload to the right and unload to the left and then you, you know, unload to the right and unload to the left. So it made a lot of sense. So anyway, that's how it's, uh, it seems to be uh, explained. All right, thank you. And thank you Alvaro for that question. Uh, another one question this time from Pamela. Um, are there any construction plans for the Northwest or far West, West, West side of campus? North, Northwest would be? Yeah, I mean, you, in the last few years, we've built a tremendous amount of, of new housing. I mean, if you go back over the last 15 years, there's a lot of new graduate housing. So of course the new Ashdown, um, the warehouse, the Sydney Pacific. Um, and so, you know, there's growth and development in that direction. There are a few uh, spaces that MIT owns. We cannot speak for campus planning, but one of the happy um, developments in Cambridge in the last 20 years is the growth of biotech and certainly the pandemic is going to continue to accelerate that. And so one of MIT's opportunities as well as challenges is if you have a piece of land and a, and a biotech lab is willing to pay buku dollars for a 20 year lease for that, you know, do you do that or do you build student housing? This is a very real tension. And, um, and uh, but so I can't say much more than that, but there is some there is some more room for further expansion and um, 
And I, I think that is a natural outgrowth in the coming decades to the West. All right. Um, we have just a couple more questions, uh, if, if that's all right with both of you. I'll yep. take that as a yes. yes sure. <laughs> Can you comment on the role of the engineers Stone and Webster in the designing of the interior of the main group? That one's from Moira. Um, yeah, Stone and Webster were the engineers of the main building and they did an unbelievably fabulous job. Um, and I would say, you know, this part of the success of the main building goes, a lot of it goes to them. Um, you know, the, the actual, con I, don't, you know, I never could find the, a, a, the contracts uh, that were laid out. Uh, but um, as John pointed out, uh, getting the stone and the material and the concrete uh, onto the site and building this, you know, um, really it's sort of 13, 6, 9, 19, 13, so it's almost three years, right? You know, period. Yeah. It, 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 totally an unbelievable thing, you know, and one of the really sort of the great achievements of, of the age is this, the speed by which this was done. Um, and uh, Stone had a, you know, a strong relationship with Bosworth, uh, so the, the engineer and the architect got along very well, which is a, also <laughs> a good thing. Uh, too. Those partnerships do work better if they go along. Um, yeah. One final question from Shannon. I may have missed you mentioning the stud, uh, that W22 W20 building. The what are center. the, yes, the student center. What are future plans for this building? Do you know? Well, the student center is a, is a significant building, a brutalist concrete building by our former colleague, architect Eduardo Catalano. Um, and, you know, it's often been a bit of a puzzle. Um, I, I will tell you that I knew Catalano personally and before he passed away, he told me that he built one imperfection into the top of the building, much the way that in the Islamic world, a weaver would intentionally put a mistake in a rug so as not to surpass, you know, the beauty of Allah. So he pointed out where the imperfection is. Um, and for $5, I'm happy to share that with anybody. Otherwise, the building is absolutely perfect. Um, no, but the, the real point is that over time, that's a building that MIT has struggled to, I would say, activate different spaces and, uh, and the ventilation hasn't been very good over time. So I, I don't see any plans to change it in the near future. And I think more and more we're seeing architectural preservation as like the Boston City Hall really value brutalist architecture for being of a certain time in, uh, in you know, architectural development. So what do you think, Mark? Yeah, it's a controversial building in that sense. I mean, uh, I mean, it, it was designed, you couldn't tell if it was designed to attack the students or for the students to attack the professors, so to speak. <laughs> you know, they're the little, it's like a, you know, like a castle on top, right? With the little slots, you know, where you can shoot down. Yeah, you know, either for students to shoot why the would you do that or vice campus? versa. You know, why would you make a building that, that looks like a castle on a campus, you know? Um, and I remember, you know, from the 80s when it was really grungy on the inside and maybe some of the older folk, it was really, really grungy. Um, and the clangy metal plates and everything on the inside. So they rehabbed it nicely, put in, they, cl they cleaned up the windows and put in a nice uh, painted the balustrades purple and pink um and made it um a little bit more uh habitable uh but it's not going anywhere for a long time that's for sure <laughs> well it it certainly gives the students something to talk about and yeah. a bonding experience even if if they don't enjoy the architecture as much uh thank you so much for the talk and i a lot of the people who came to the talk today also super enjoyed it as uh, Stephanie said, I really appreciate the sense of humor and it was a super incredibly informative talk. I, I deeply appreciated it and I'm, I'm sure everyone else did as well. Our pleasure. Well, thank you all so much for joining and thanks thank for having you. us. Yeah, um, Mark and John, thank you again so much for all. Truly an amazing talk today. And like Fufi mentioned, so, so much applause from everyone. So thank you so much. Um, and, you know, as my tech was once a resident of um, 
Building 20, <laughs> that famous Building 20 long ago. Um, what, you know, it's just, it's amazing to see the, the evolution of MIT and hear about it. So thank you again. Thank you all. Have a good night and be safe. Be safe.